We're live. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to do another episode of Follow Along Friday. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free to submit them below, and we'll go ahead and get going. There we are. All right. There we are. Hello. And is it recording? The oh, yep. Oh, that's okay. Cool. Best ever listeners, how you doing? Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. I am with our co-host for Follow Along Fridays, Theo Hicks. Hello. How's it going, Joe? It's going well. And today we've got uh, an, a, an assortment of different things to talk about. Uh, so how should we kick it off? Well, do you want to kick it off with your, with your story that involves turtles? A turtle, yes, the turtle story. <laughs> uh, so... This is, for Follow Along Friday, we talk about experiences that we've had uh, the, over the previous week that are applicable to us as real estate investors and entrepreneurs. And there is a story about a turtle that is applicable uh, that I want to quickly tell. So last Friday, I'm uh, driving and um, I'm on a like a two lane country road ish, and then all of a sudden there's a a, tr a truck that stopped ahead of me, and so I slow down and and right before that, um, I sw had to swerve, and all the all the, the truck in front of me had to swerve to miss a turtle on the road in the, mm. in the middle of the road in the middle of, in the middle of our lane. So I, the truck had to swerve in front of me, then I had to swerve, and we, we both missed it, thankfully. And then all of a sudden, this truck stops. And I'm like, well, what, you know, what are we doing? And he stops about 25, 30 yards after we swerved to miss the turtle. Uh, and it just coincidentally happened, he happened to stop where these people were doing road work. So I thought, this guy's you know, being flagged by the construction workers mm -hmm. because we have to stop. And then I look behind me, and there's about six to seven cars behind me as well. So this truck in front of me stops in the middle of the road, and the guy gets out. He's on his phone, and so I think he's with the construction crew, mm. uh, and he walks past my car, and he walks 25, 50 yards back, and I'm like, what is he doing? I, I, I've got places to go, people to see. And then as he's walking back towards his truck, he's got the turtle in his hand. And my initial reaction was, I said this out loud in my car, are you serious all for a effing turtle? <laughs> That's what I said. And you know, I, I had a moment of realization. I was like, wait a second, catch yourself, Joe. He just saved an animal's life. Mm -hmm. And it took maybe two minutes out of my day to do that. And by the way, I was driving to a hospice facility <laughs> to go volunteer uh, to go hang out with a hospice patient that mm -hmm. I see every Friday. So I'm thinking that's his way of contributing for this day or in this moment. And, and the takeaway I got from it was one careful about initially judging people's actions and what they're up to. Two is we all contribute in different ways towards society, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, saving a turtle or whether it's doing something else. And it's important to take that into account as we go out through the day and, and perhaps not initially judge people for actions that they're doing um, that at the time, I immediately think, "Oh man, what are you doing? You're 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 in my way." Mm -hmm. um, but instead, you know, having a little bit more self-reflection, and and my so my initial reaction was, I wrote it down. I was like, "Oh my God, are you serious? All for a effing turtle?" But then I was like, "Wait a second, let me let me take a step back." And then I appreciate what he was doing. That's, that's a good anecdote, and it it also reminds me of a kind of a play off of something that. That uh, Ben Franklin, because there's a, there, he, he, if you look at his routine, his routine is pretty crazy. But his like morning, his daily routine. But in part of his routine, in the morning and at night, he asks, he answer, asks and answers one question. And at night, he says like, "What good did I do today?" And kind of a, a play off of that would be, you know, who did I, or or how did I, you know, help or contribute today? And so for that guy, 
it could have been his turtle butt. They've been that turtle, but you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of look at it, you know, like you do a podcast and you're always putting out all this information, but maybe not every single person who's an investor is want, want to create a podcast. And, and just because you're not, you know, adding value by having a podcast or writing blogs, doesn't mean you can do nothing. You know, just by sharing a podcast or someone could be just as as valuable to someone as actually creating it or you know sharing a post or you know uh, writing a review on yeah. someone's um, you know book uh, is, is is a great way to. To, to add value as well. So that's something that I've tried to incorporate into my nightly routine, which is, you know, who or how did I contribute or help today mm. instead of always focusing on on consuming, you know, content. So mm. I, I, th- I think those are kind of... I related. like that. I like that a lot. What what did I contribute today? Mm-hmm. That's a... That's a that, that could be a game-changing question. It's, it's similar to what did I learn today, but... Um, they're cousins. They're not. They they're not directly related. They're cousins, uh, and I think asking maybe those two questions. You ask those two questions. Maybe I'll start doing this. Ask those two questions every day. How did I contribute today to others, and what did I learn today? Because when you're learning, you're contributing to yourself mm-hmm. and you're improving. So you've got both bases covered: other people and yourself. Yeah, and and I think it's important just. I mean, it's just why you journal, just to know what you're actually doing. Because if you're, if you're not doing something, then you'll know. But if you're doing something, then you kind of like, I wouldn't say reward yourself, but at least like pat yourself in the back. And like, all right, I actually accomplished something today. Mm-hmm. If, you don't, if you don't ever write anything down or don't ever ask yourself questions, then who knows what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've, you mentioned the journal thing, and I've mentioned it before, but just as a seven-second recap, I do a daily journal. It's in a Word document. Every single day, it's a date, bullet points, and then that's it. It's pretty cool to see what you've done over the past now. I've been doing it for a year. Uh, it, well, June of two, uh, June 28, 2015 was the very first day I did it. So I've been doing it since that long. Yeah. Cool. All right. So moving on, something else we want to start doing on here is talking about any mistakes we've made in the past week and you know, what we did to, to fix them so that best ever listener, if they come across the same mistake, they can learn from from ours. So do you want to yeah. do yours first? Yeah, and the reason why this is, this is coming up is because I was on a call with a listener who was applying to be in my uh, consulting multifamily program, and he said that he everything I do turns to gold, and that I know he knows that I don't make big mistakes. I'm like, where the hell did you get that from? <laughs> And I said, I, I, I guess I need to be more, uh, put more emphasis on my mistakes because, man, I'm making them every single day and I'm making big ones every week mm-hmm. and, and even larger ones every year. So I, I, I think it will, be, it will be important to give some um, perspective and, and context for the good stuff that's going on in the business, but then also sprinkling in on a consistent basis what mistakes I'm making, and you've got mistakes mm-hmm. too that we're, we're going to come up uh, and, and share. So the mistake of the week for me is the Tony Ro- Tony Robin, the to- <laughs> Tony Hawk video. You're, you're future pacing there. You're yeah, going to be having him soon. <laughs> exactly. We are in talks with Tony Robbins uh, one of his publicists to be on the show the the Tony Hawk interview was, went live uh, th- on Thursday of what last I don't know what, today I think it went live yesterday it went live uh, yesterday so on, on Wednesday of this week uh, Wednesday of this week yeah this week it went live this week and it basically it was um, so I interviewed Emmett Smith I thought that went really well I thought mm-hmm. that was a, a great interview one piece of feedback I got from that from someone was it was all roses and sunshine and, and ponies and pigtails perhaps ask about what's a flop that you had and I had that in my questions I just I didn't ask I should have and so moving forward I also I will make sure I ask that to these high profile people who mm-hmm. I'm interviewing um, so I thought that went well though overall uh, but Tony Hawk I thought I was too prepared for, hmm. and and I actually had too many prepared questions that I wanted to ask him, and I did too much re- too much research, 
and I didn't think that interview flowed well. And it was not his fault, it was my fault. I will also say that my, my, my calendar got really uh, packed that day, as it usually does. And one of the things I did, and I never do this, uh, is that I met with a, an investor at a bar right around the corner. I rode my bike to the bar, had a beer, mm -hmm. had a Miller Lite, and then rode my bike back home to my office where I record the podcast. And, you know, so I was, I had one beer in me as well. And I, I'm not a lightweight, right? I, I can handle more <laughs> than one beer. But at the same time, I don't know if that influenced my direction at all. I, I just didn't feel like I did a good job. And the reason why was I was over prepared. So the lesson is that sometimes, um, what you've been doing and how you've been preparing for future people is the same way you should prepare for someone else. Um, and I, I guess, I guess that's interview specific. Let me make it more broad. Uh, trust your instincts. Have, have the baseline knowledge that you need, but then trust your instincts. I guess that's what it boils down yeah. to. And that, that goes with people when you're interviewing team members. Have a process. That, that you know works, but then ultimately go with your gut and common sense versus trying to force fit a process into something because ultimately when you do that, it's a mechanical object versus a fluid dynamic piece of art mm -hmm. that you're, you're wanting to, to do. And so that can be applied on when you look at deals and interview team members, etc. Yeah, I, I, I took that um, that, that, that Dale Carnegie that public speak, it was, I mean, it was just called Dale Carnegie course, but it was a lot about communicating. And one of the rules that they had was never script out a speech, like never have exactly what you're going to say and, and memorize it because then while you're giving your speech, you're just going to be like in your mind, just like thinking, okay, like what's the next word I'm going to say? And it seems kind of like what you're saying too, that you were, you were very rehearsed and you had like all the questions prepared beforehand that you weren't able to kind of like go off script a little bit. Um, and and that was you know a, a big piece of advice that I learned from Dale Carnegie because before I always thought oh you just you just script everything and you know very structured so you don't you don't mess up or it doesn't you know go off off course but in reality especially in an interview format that's kind of what you want to have happen because if you mm -hmm. you know ask a question here and then you, you you jump something completely random you might have been able to get something else out of that but when, when I actually listened to your interview um, I thought it was very cool that you you know some of the questions you asked and how you. Um, like you know how you asked him about like the, like the 900 spin and how you know he, 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 and he said also you know so you knew that but then he also knew that he talked about that and said that it was you know more mental than physical and so you kind of like built off of that so I thought that was 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 really cool and he, if you looked at his face like oh wow this guy was mm -hmm. was prepared so it, I mean maybe you were prepared this time but um, I think it still has the positive showing that you came into this ready to ask a bunch of questions mm -hmm. that no one else would have asked yeah so. yeah I appreciate it I, I think I think the questions that were, were, were good, um, but I didn't do a good job of, once I asked the question, being in tune with the conversation enough where I could then follow up and dig in a little bit yeah. in, into what his responses were. It was more surface level. I had prepared questions. He answered them, and I moved on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that I, I, I need to bring to the table that's better, and so yeah. there you go. So what's your mistake? Well, before the mistake, something else that you were saying about the, about you're talking about mistakes. Now someone asked you, you know, hey Joe, you know, uh, yeah. you don't ever, you don't ever make any mistakes. Like it's, it's crazy. Um, I think it was I think it was show nine hundred ninety one. Um, it was about how to be a, a guru, is what the episode was entitled, and. Um, Essentially, it, uh, the, the person was, was saying how anyone who has any experience as a real estate investor could be a, a, a quote unquote guru. But the type of guru she was talking about was someone that, that, you, that literally uses their mistakes and like monetizes them. And so what they'll do is they'll have a consulting program or give talks or do whatever where they focus on the mistakes that they made and talk about, no, this is a problem, this is the issue that I ran into. You're going to run into this issue too. Here's how I overcame it. And that's really all you do. Um, I thought that was interesting because she was also talking about how you know the gurus that people may not necessarily uh, I wouldn't I say not like but don't get a, a much as much value from are the ones that always talk about like the good yeah. and never talk about the bad which is why I think it's good that we're going to talk about mistakes on Fall on Friday but also for your podcast you know every single podcast you ask mm -hmm. what's your biggest mistake and they always go into some sort of mistake that they made so people know that everything does not going to go smoothly in mm -hmm. in real estate so I wanted yeah. to mention that. We henceforth we will have yeah. a mistake that each of us has made the previous week, 
And it's not about mentioning this. I told, I, I talked to Theo about this before the show. It's not about just mentioning the mistake. It's about, as you just said, what did we learn from it and how can that be applied for every listener um, who could come across that similar situation. Yeah. So my mistake is very specific. It's not as broad as, as Joe's was, but I was, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm currently under contract for three, four unit properties, so 12 units total. And I was doing the inspections um, last week and we walked through every single unit and some of the tenants were, were home, some of them weren't. And for the tenants that were home. You call them tenants or residents? I, I call them residents now. <laughs> um, they were home and they asked me who I was. And I said I was the owner or I plan on buying the properties. And I mean. Because it felt good at the time. You're like, yeah, yeah. I'm the one buying these well, properties. Yeah, exactly. It did feel you, got, good. you got a little ego hit. I you, did. Or a little ego boost, rather. Yep. yep. And so. I, I did that, and one of the tenants, one of the residents, uh, instantly went into this, this story about their about their lives. <laughs> and this guy was like, you know, I, I live in this I live in this apartment. Uh, I've been living here for you know this many years. I, the reason I moved here is because my last apartment burned down, and I had all this you know custom German furniture that all was was gone. And you know now I'm like, now, now I don't need anything. Now I just sleep on my couch, and I've got a picture of my wife up there who died 20 years ago, and I can't wait to see her again. I got cancer and all this stuff. And you know, I, I, I was sympathized with him like a lot, but I, I, I walked away and I, I remember I looked at Marcel and I was like, I guess I mean, we can't kick this guy out, we can't raise his rent, like we can't do anything here because we're so emotionally attached to this guy now. And so I guess the, 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 the moral, the, what, the takeaway that I got, um, without trying to sound too cold, because again, at the end of the day, it is an investment, but I also want to take care of your, of your residents um, and we're not gonna raise this guy's rent. But at the end of the day, I realized that when I'm visiting these properties moving forward, when, and when I meet the rest of the residents, I'm not going to tell them that I'm the actual owner of the property. I'm going to say I work for the management company, or I'm 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 someone else, and you know I report to the owner. And I, I just intuitively that makes a lot more sense because you know if they're telling they want they're going to tell a sob story to the property manager because he doesn't really have any control. Or if they do, I can just say you know I'm the manager. I don't you know I don't have control of it. But also I, I feel as if they're going to communicate with you differently if they know you own the property versus. Um, just some random guy that, that manages it. And if you are buying it with your... Girlfriend's not as strong of a word as we need, but I mean, Marcel is your... Yeah. You, you two are together. Uh, you are basically reporting to her. So <laughs> There you go. Perfect. <laughs> you, you do report to the owner. <laughs> so I'm not lying. <laughs> You're not lying. <laughs> exactly. And applying this for uh, other aspects from a negotiation standpoint, when you find yourself in a negotiation, it's always better to say, well, I don't have the authority, but I can talk to someone who does. That way, for the most part, there, there's exceptions, but for the most part, it's good because then you can, uh, you can, you don't have, you don't feel pressure to agree to whatever they're asking for at that moment. Mm. And then you can go back and uh, renegotiate. That's what I remember when I was in advertising trying to get uh, a higher salary. Uh, I was talking to the CFO of the company and he's like, well, I don't have the control to do it. I'm like, I'm thinking, come on, man. Yeah, you do. You got, you're the CFO. <laughs> but that's just something that has, um, can, can help. And similarly, you know, the property manager could say the same thing about, you know, well, I, I can't, I don't control X, Y, Z. I have to talk to the owner and you have to report into Mar yeah. Marcella, so it kind of works out. And I think, I think like as investors, you understand that, well, the property manager does, does kind of maybe have some control, but for them, it's kind of, the, for the, the residents, I think it, once they hear that, they realize you're not the owner. I think it just diffuses the situation and they're not gonna you know, ask you certain questions or demand certain things mm -hmm. based off of that. So, cool. so there's two mistakes you guys got for today cool. to learn from. Um, something else we want to talk about is, is you're reading a book, the 80-20 book, and there was a interesting survey that um, we want to talk about that I'm going to take this week in order to uh, talk about the results. But do you want to talk about the survey? Or do you want me sure, to explain it? Sure. It is in the book. It's Perry Marshall's book called 8020 Sales and Marketing. Mm -hmm. The whole premise is, I mean, you know the premise, right? 80%, uh, the 20% of the results, wait, what is it? 20, 80% of the results come from 20% of your actions. Yep. And it's identifying what is that 20% so that you can maximize the results. It's a principle that's been tried and true 
uh, for a long time, and he wrote a book on this. And I actually had already read this book. Hmm. Uh, it was on the bookshelf in my living room, and I happened to just pick it up. And I'd already outlined this part in, when I read it about, I don't know, two, three years ago, maybe longer. I just happened to open up the book to this page, and I was like, you know what, this would be a good exercise to to do. And um, so Theo is doing it, <laughs> and the exercise, the the outcome of the exercise, is to identify what your superhuman strength is, basically. And the way to do the exercise is well. The, that's the outcome and the reason why you want to identify your superhuman strength what's the one or two things that you're especially good at is it's so obvious uh, by doing all these interviews I've done and by experiencing things I've experienced when we focus on what we're incredibly good at that one or maybe two things and know how that relates in the context of our business and do that 100% then your business will flourish. Find the people who uh, can complement your strengths in the other areas of your business. But when you focus on your superhuman strength, then your business will flourish, assuming that you've got other people complimenting you mm -hmm. on the other aspects of the business. Therefore, uh, the approach for how to do that is, you wanna explain the approach? Yeah. So basically you wanna find, a, you wanna create a list of five people that that know you from different aspects of life, so they kind of they see you at work and at home or a family, and so they, they know different parts of your personality. Because obviously you act differently depending on where you're at. You can make a list of, of five people, and then you want. And, and I guess the only other requirement is you, in the book it said know them for for basically between one and five years. So they, so, they, so they know you more than just a couple of months, and then you want to send them an email, basically asking them what do they believe you do better than other people and, mm -hmm. and that's it and so you ask that the five people and then once you get those responses back you compile them and you figure out you know what's the one thing that um, everyone said uh, and then or what did most people say or what did at least two people say was your you know, your unique gift your unique capability your strength and then you want to take that and kind of create a a, 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 a paragraph that basically explains what is your unique talent what are you really good at and then now that and once you know that and you're getting it you know objectively from someone else then you can create a plan of how to cultivate that and so for example if someone comes back to me and says you know Theo you're really you're a really good public speaker or you're really good at you know communicating ideas then I'm like all right so I'm good at that now how can I make that even better so maybe I can enroll in you know a, some sort of public speaking course or you know start a a, a, a pod a, a YouTube channel or a podcast where I practice talking every single day or just do you know 50 minutes a day of just Except for any speaking to myself that no one even hears, so I can get get better at it. And so that's the. I think the important part after you identify it is also thinking about how can that be applied towards the business that I'm in. Yep, exactly. That, that's that's the the last part I think that you want to do because you want to continue to hone it. But if you're honing it in a silo then it won't be as much help. So we, so that would be another thing that um, maybe step yeah. six or whatever it is yeah. to then think, okay, how can I continue to leverage this one skill in the business? And then maybe think through how is that monetized? How, I don't know if monetizable is a word, but how, it can, is now. I, it is now. <laughs> how can I monetize that within the, the, you know, the structure of the business? Yep. And so I'm going to do this exercise this week and then I'll report back next week with the results. So you, all right. So the last thing we want to talk about is a, is a question I found on, on, on Bigger Pockets, but I thought it was interesting. I thought it'd be very valuable um, to anyone who's trying to raise private money for, for deals. And the question was, what is the number one question that is holding back investors? Or what is the number one thing that's holding back investors from investing in your deals? So based off of all the deals you've done, all the money you've raised, What's the, I guess the one hesitation or the one reason why investors say, eh, I'm not interested in investing in this deal or interested in investing with you or, or, or however you want to approach that, that question? Um, you know, the, for 
for anyone who doesn't invest, it's tough to get an answer from them mm. for why. Uh, usually, after we have a conversation, if they decide not to invest and have a deal, then they're not responsive. Mm. Uh, so that's and this is a, a very I mean small percentage of the people who I talk to the majority of people invest uh, who are accredited and who are looking to invest at least 50k um, I'd say one the one thing that keeps like shouting out in my mind <laughs> right now is they want more active control mm -hmm. of, of okay. the deal they're I'd say that's I from the people who I do have feedback from that's the main thing. Okay. They they don't want to be as passive as how uh, syndications are set up. They want more say in the operations or they want more say in when we sell mm. or they want more say in or they want more voting rights for multiple things and okay. the reality is as a passive investor in our deals you're putting faith in the team myself and Frank to have to be savvy enough to handle whatever challenges come up and to make sure the interest of everyone is is taken care of and how that's done is not just by trusting us blindly but by structuring the deal so that there's alignment of interest within the deal. For example, having a preferred return so limited partners get paid first. Um, for example, having the having us, Frank and I, invest alongside investors in every deal so our money's treated just like theirs. And then, for example, on the sale, the general partnership, so myself and Frank and um, we will not receive a penny until the preferred return is paid back and their money is paid back. Mm -hmm. So we have checks and balances in place that have alignment of interest, but ultimately someone might want to be more active. And that's why on my investwithjoe.com page, I put, are you looking to passively invest at least 50000 And passively is important because if they're looking to be active and you can make more money when you're active I mean, because because there's not I'm not yeah. involved right there's not a middle person involved who's handling everything you make more money if you're active assuming that you've got the risks mitigated um, there's more risk I suspect if it's if you're active though too uh, so that, that would be the main thing that jumps okay. out and then, and then a good way to address that would be to basically proactively say you know wherever you're trying to find your investors just let, let them know what you're what your requirements are for investors, you know, accredited and passive. And, That's it, yeah. yeah. Are you, uh, the, the only two questions I have on investwithjoe.com, I guess technically three, are one, are you, look, are you accredited? Two, are you looking to passively invest at least 50,000? And three, what else, tell me a little bit more about yourself yeah. that, you, that is relevant for me to know. And then I jump on a call with them, I get to know them, build a relationship with them, and um, then after we have a relationship, uh, then that might lead to some business later. Okay. Cool. Sweet. All right. Best ever listeners, that's a wrap. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, oh. Um, basketball, what was the score for the winner? It was – you won, obviously. You keep winning. I think it might have been thir I think it might have been thirteen eleven. Thirteen eleven. Okay, thirteen eleven. I got a lot closer. Thirteen eleven, and I beat him in horse, and then I lost this this the other game, uh, fourteen to twelve. Fourteen eleven. Oh no, the first game was fourteen was fourteen eleven. Fourteen eleven was the first game. I think the second one was a little bit. It was a pretty big discrepancy. Oh, I was not <laughs> seeing it. I thought it was third. I thought it was thirteen. All right, we forgot. We'll go. No, that was two weeks ago. That was two weeks ago. That was okay. two weeks ago. No, both of them were really close. Okay, but one was closer. So anyway, uh, whoever picked the closest to fourteen to 11. 11. 14, 11, Theo won. Fourteen, eleven. But I, my secret shot is starting to get better and better. Uh, fourteen, eleven. Uh, so Samantha will reach out to you if you won and you'll get the signed copy of the book uh, volume one and volume two from both of us and uh we doing it again we playing again let's do it yeah all right we're playing again same thing whoever's closest 
uh, pick total points, pick the winner, uh, only one entry per person. That's it. Have a wonderful weekend.